Hi everyone, I'm Michael Wayne. This is Voices for the Future. And I'm here with my colleague, Anna Anna Day, Judith. Judith. Yeah. And delighted to be working with Michael in the Voices for the Future webinar series that we've been doing and bringing all sorts of people talking about where we're going and how to create a sustainable future. And we've got a really special guest today. Michael Ben Ellie and Michael's going to Michael Wayne is going to introduce him. We've got two Michaels tonight. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you, Anna Dea. Yeah, Michael is the founder and director of the Sustainability Laboratory, and and the talk tonight will be on understanding sustainability. So, hi, Michael, and let me uh, give you a formal introduction by reading a short bio about you. Um, you're the founder and director of the Sustainability Laboratory which was established in 2008 in order to advance the concept of sustainability, expanding prospects and producing positive life-affirming impacts on people and ecosystems in all parts of the world. And prior to launching the lab, you pioneered applications of systems thinking and cybernetics in management and organization. And you've worked on synthesizing strategy issues in many parts of the world in diverse institutional settings. You're the author of the widely acclaimed five core sustainability principles, and you're the leading develop and your leading development of the lab is a worldwide network of ecozone-based eco activity centers. And in 2016, you were inducted into the International Green Industry Hall of Fame and recognized with the organization's Lifetime Achievement Award. So welcome, Michael. It's it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you. And and really. You're one of the um, unsung heroes of the world. And I say that <laughs> and, all. and it, I, I know it uh, sounds. Thank you for having me, whether singing or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. So, so first, um, before we go right into, I'm gonna show a video about the sustainability lab for everyone to see. It's um, two and a half minutes long. So I have it queued up. So, Let's see. So let's um, let's do it. Our planet is in distress. Persistent, insensitive human activities now threaten every vital component of the biosphere including the well-being of our own species. We are faced with a choice, continuous deterioration or commitment to sustainability. Transitioning from the current state of affairs to a sustainable basis is an unprecedented challenge. There is no blueprint to guide us. We need bold experimentation with new ways of thinking and acting. This is why we established the Sustainability Laboratory, a global platform for sustainability innovations, a catalyst inspiring positive change. In our development projects, we work collaboratively with communities to bring about sustainability-related transformations. In our education initiatives, we help train future leaders to tackle the urgent sustainability issues facing the planet. And in our research projects, we foster groundbreaking innovations in technology. This is the Sustainability Laboratory, aiming to expand prospects and produce positive, life-affirming impacts on people and ecosystems in all parts of the world, joining with others to ensure a transition to a sustainable future. Excellent, great video, Michael. Yeah, incidentally, both videos, this one and the one that you'll show later are produced by one of our alumni, alumnus from the, the Global Sustainability Fellows Program. Oh, well, that's great. They, they've done a great job and they've really um, helped to uh, really just put it together in a really nice way. 
So, um, and, and so as we were talking before we came on, here we are talking about sustainability and, and we're having it right in our face. When we talk about sustainability, we're, we're looking at, we're, the, the subject really is climate change and we're having it right in our face right now with what's going on in the Pacific Northwest and the record setting um, heat wave going on there. So very appropriate time, Michael. Um, so so, so let, let's uh, dive right into it. What got you interested in starting the sustainability laboratory? Uh, how far back you want to go? <laughs> I'm curious how long idea. it's been going. <laughs> I'll start with the idea of the lab itself and then we can go uh, what happened before that. But uh, as, as you know, I, done some work over the years with the large multilateral development agencies like the World Bank and uh, some of the environmental, the global environmental conventions, the global environmental facility and, and others. Uh, and because of my interest in the topic, I was for a long time very happy to be in that environment, thinking that I'm really experiencing and perhaps contributing something to the cutting edge of what was happening uh, in, in that world. Uh, that was probably early on to after the Rio summit of 82, it was early on to embrace all these ideas that now we look under the umbrella of sustainability, but it didn't take long to really feel increasingly uneasy about that world and about the huge gap between the rhetoric of sustainable development and what was actually happening on the ground. And that led me to realize that it was, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a waste of time. It's not a nice expression, but that I was not in the, wrong, the right place. And there was no many other places to go. Uh, and so the resolution for me was to establish the lab. And the idea behind the lab was actually very simple. And that is that the kind of challenges that we are facing on the planet today in terms of the required transition to another way of being and another way of behaving are entirely unprecedented. Yes, There's no, there are no experts. No one can tell you what to do. There's no cookbook. There's no recipe that you can just follow blindly. Uh, and if you don't have uh, those kinds of an instrument, you have to experiment. And most of the organization that I have experienced, both in the public, international, and in the private sector, were not really designed for the kind of radical innovation, radical experimentation that needed to take uh, place. Uh, if you want to develop a career in the World Bank, for example, uh, and this is not saying anything derogatory about the World Bank, but if you are a person, you want to develop a career there, you cannot make too many mistakes. So uh, you cannot really experiment freely, uh, if you know what I mean. So where do you experiment? You experiment in the lab. And what does the planet need now? A global laboratory for sustainability education, uh, innovations. And no one was doing it, so why not do it? So as you said, in 2008, this very, uh, uh, how do you call it, very uh, naive, perhaps Don Quixote idea uh, took over and we just announced the establishment of the lab. Yeah, so, so I want to um, backtrack a little bit before we really dig into the lab. When you talk about the Don Quixote, um, doing Don, the, your Don Quixote work and tilting at windmills, because your life was changed when you were a young man by your chance encounter with Buckminster Fuller. And I'd really like to, I mean, we don't want to spend the whole time talking about it, but I just want to, um, um, because Buckminster Fuller was a man who, with a strong will, tilted at windmills and really, really affected the world. And um, just want to um, share this picture. I got there. You are with with <laughs> Buckminster Fuller. That's in Africa, incidentally. Uh, what year, in what year would that be? In Ghana. Yeah, and in, what year in, would that have been? This is uh, sixty. My God, 64 or 65. Oh, wow. Wow. And it's yeah. in the architectural school in Kumasi, 
what used to be at the time the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Oh, yeah. So there you are, kind of like the passing of the, the torch in a way. But <laughs> but so so I know I know the story of your chance encounter with Buckminster Fuller, but but it really made an indelible mark and really has inspired you. So I'm just you could share with people. Because it, it, it's a very inspiring story for anybody to follow their passion and dream. So if you could just um, tell well, quickly. As a, as a youngster, teenager, I uh, had very strong reactions to buildings. And my mother would drag me around Europe to all the classical, you know, from the Parthenon to the this to the that, all the classical architectures. I think... Uh, Kind of had some impact and then later on uh, i think more than anything else frank lloyd writes waterfall that very well-known building in mm. pennsylvania uh, was such an inspiration that i decided to study architecture and it took some time to get there but the 21 when i finished the military service in israel where i grew up i left for london to study at the aa and as it turned out was, uh, I, I really had no concept about anything of those global issues that we are talking about today. Uh, and uh, during, it was actually just in the very beginning of the first semester of the first year, Bucky happened to be in London and he gave a lecture to the Association of British Architectural Students. I didn't know anything about it. I just ended up there by, by chance more than anything else. I haven't heard his name. I really didn't know anything about him. And what he was talking about was a project that he was promoting in those days that he called the World Design Science Decade, where the idea, what he, <laughs> he was talking about Don Quixote. And <laughs> he was, uh, what he was talking about was for all the architectural students around the world, all the architectural schools to collaborate on a 10 year program to do what? To redesign the world and deal with all those issues of uh, managing world resources and population and everything else, all the items that today come under the sustainability umbrella. Now, I never heard anything like this. To me, architecture was, uh, as I said, Frank Lloyd Wright or Corbusier, you know, you design a building or you design a chair. And here was somebody talking about the planet as a whole, as an object of design and calling for a major design revolution. Saying we are not going to do it any other way other than by superior design. It's not going to politics that will lead us there. It's not going to be just talking whatever you have to actually sit down and uh, like a designer think about how to create whatever needs to be created to ensure a better world. And uh, so as it turned out in those things, next to me was sitting a young, uh, a young uh, uh, a professor from the AA, Keith Critchlow, who just passed away uh, last year. Uh, Keith was a painter turned mathematician. I, he was not a direct uh, tutor to me, but I knew him from the school. So in my great excitement, I turned to him and said, how can we participate in that great program of designing, <laughs> redesigning the world? And Keith mentioned that he already was doing some research with Fuller on Fuller geometry, synergetic geometry, and that he was uh, planning to meet with him the next morning for breakfast. And why don't I join? <laughs> So, uh, you know, uh -huh. the next morning I went to that breakfast like you uh, approach uh, Mount Sinai or Mecca or something like this. And we did hit it personally right away in a, in a very strong way, Bucky and I. And uh, Keith and I decided to start working on the program for the AA. And that started a very long association with Fuller. The AA in those days was very, uh, still is probably, uh, but it's a long time. It was a very progressive, very avant-garde school. And they basically... And what does AA stand for, for our the listeners? Architectural Association. AA, okay. Architectural Association in London. 
Yeah. Uh, so basically, they allowed me off of schoolwork. It was a five-year course in, uh, in lieu of my work with Fulham. So I had to pass every year the requirements of everybody else, but they didn't care where I was. So the second year, I spent with him in Ghana, which is the picture that you saw earlier on, uh -huh. where we were experimenting with different kinds of structures and so on. And then when I graduated after five years, he invited me to join him here which is how I continued working with him and how I got to the States in the first place. So that's in a nutshell, the, yeah. the, the story of my encounter yeah. with Fuller, but there's no question that that was a very uh, powerful, very major milestone. It's almost like a billiard ball that knocks another ball and just change the angle completely. Uh -huh. So I can say uh, with great humility, uh, uh, not only acknowledge his uh, his influence, but uh, everything that I was that I've been doing since has really been in pursuit of the vision that he projected in those days. And that vision is world design, designing the world, right? It's you know when you say designing the world, it sounds now too mechanical and too uh, limited uh, in a sense, and and perhaps. Uh, Rightly so, you're not going to design the world. But the idea that there is a major task for humanity to deal with, that things were not going in the right direction, and that the way to deal with it is by better design, if you like. Uh -huh. And the connotations of design in that sense are important because, uh, you know, when we deal with issues, we like to focus on the concept of problem solving. When you problem solve, you become, you, 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 you kind of become arrested by the program, by the problem. <laughs> you, you see what I mean, the epistemology of the problem, whatever, you, you, you are entrapped with the problem issue, where the design You're approach- You're slipping up the path. Exactly, the design approach tries in a very different way, trying to project an image, a vision, a specification of something you want to attain. And it can be a condition for the planet or it can be performance specification for a new airplane or something. But you don't start with the problem. You start with what it is that you want to achieve even before you know how to do it, even before you know whether you have the resources to achieve it, even before the science or the technology exists in order to approach it. So you project that vision. What is the preferred state? What is it that I want to achieve? And then you cast back to ask the question, what has to happen? What has to come together for that to happen? And it's a completely different approach, of course. Uh, and uh, it's something that I think one can adopt for everything, not just for designing the world, but for designing my own life and yeah. dealing with interpersonal issues, with uh, social issues, almost any any kind of thing that you need to tackle. Yeah. And when we're not being what we want, that's when the problems appear. They appear in the vacuum of not designing the world we want to be. I, I think that the, the, the first thing, of course, is to start by what is the world that we want to? Ask that question. And what uh, are your views on that? I'm sorry? And what are your views on that, the way you design for the world you want it to be? Well, I, 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 the way that I approached it was uh, not to try and pay, paint a idealistic picture with roses and butterflies and, and smiling kids and so forth, but to try to understand what does the concept of sustainability really mean. And by trying to yeah. get deeper into the meaning of the concept and the, the, the producing a, def, a, a more rigorous definition of sustainability, uh, try to see what are the conditions that you can uh, identify or what are the principles that you can identify as requirements for achieving that condition. I, I, I don't know if that was clear enough. In other words, what are the principles- Can you that definition? 
almost like saying if you if you want to go flying and you want to develop a, some machine to take you flying you better understand the principles of aerodynamics otherwise you end up like uh icarus and daedalus and the same here if we are serious about establishing the concept of sustainability as the organizing principle on the planet what are the principles that have to lead us in achieving that condition what are the principles in the sense of statements that you can make that are imperatives and inviolable in the sense that if you violate them you're not going to achieve it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so so talking about pillars of Okay. Oh, so so talking about sustainability. Oh, 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 sorry. Um, talking about sustainability, I know. I mean, that's. I, I assume that these were things you were pondering for quite a while and led to the um, development of the sustainability laboratory. But I know you've talked about differentiating, like like you've developed five core principles of sustainability, and you've different differentiated that from like the UN sustainable development goals. So I wonder if you could talk more about the sustainability principles that you've developed and how it differs, how you see sustainability and, and where something like the UN doesn't fully get it. Well, uh, when, when the idea gelled to launch the lab initiative, uh, the first question that arose how to differentiate it from many centers or institutes or whatever for sustainability that began to uh, come around everywhere. And the, the first thing that I thought was that you need to handle the definition itself. Uh, you are all familiar probably with the prevailing definition that came out of the United Nations Commission on sustainable, sustainable, uh, sustainability, and, uh, not sustainable development and environment. This was the Brundtland Commission. And that definition basically said that uh, sustainable development is development that takes care of current needs without jeopardizing the needs of future generations. So it's very sensible, mm -hmm. very positive sounding. And it was basically adopted, if you like, uh, as a formal, in a formal way, by the international community already in the 80s with the Rio uh, conference on environment and development. But when you think a little bit about this definition, you find that it's uh, very difficult. It has a lot of faults. And I will try to speculate about a few. First, well, future generations are not with us to decide what's good to them. So there is an ethical question there. Uh, which is, I think, is an important one. But that's the list of it. I think there's simply, from an economic point of view, there's no way to actually compute economic utility values for future generations. There's no way to do that. Uh, and then, of course, there is the larger thing that that definition doesn't define sustainability. It gives a name to a development process that has certain characteristics. It doesn't ask the question, what does sustainability mean? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. It says sustainable development is mm -hmm. a development that does this and that. It doesn't tell you what sustainability is. And if you take a system view of the concept of sustainability, when you take a system view, what does it mean? It means you, you're trying to identify for every issue of, or any something that you deal with, what are the critical variables that are involved and how they interact? And when you talk about sustainability, the two critical value variables are populations and carrying capacity. And the interaction between those two, population and carrying capacity, is a very specific kind of interaction. It's not a linear interaction, it's a circular interaction where the environment basically defines what kind of populations are possible in the first place and 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 populations and we're talking any any population any environment could be amoeba in a petri dish or lions in the savannah or humans on, on the planet and populations over time 
impact and modify the environment itself. So it's a two-way street kind of interaction where those two variables continuously define one another. And actually, if you look at the history of the biosphere, it's the history of such interaction. Uh, life as we know it today would not have been possible some million years ago where the composition of the gases in the atmosphere would be toxic to us mammals. So it took eons of microorganisms to begin to change that composition that allowed other organisms to come into the play and get the, 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 the kind of equilibrium that we achieve today. So when you look at that issue of, a popula of the, the, the interaction of population and the environment as the context for the idea of sustainability, then sustainability becomes, or you can define sustainability as the a dynamic equilibrium dynamic equilibrium in the sense that it's not something that you achieve once and for all and stay there forever. Uh, it's a dynamic equilibrium in the process of interaction between a population and the carrying capacity of its environment, such that the population can develop to express its full potential. You don't put any limitations there other than one without adversely and irreversibly affecting the carrying capacity upon, it, upon which it depends. Can you see that? I'll, I'll read it to you slowly. So let's see if it, if it uh, so sustainability, a dynamic equilibrium in the process of interaction between a population and the carrying capacity of its environment such that the population develops to express its full potential without producing irreversible adverse effect on the carrying capacity of the environment upon which it depends. And when you think about this, there, there is uh, the power of this definition. First, it mimics in its language that circularity <laughs> that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And two, every variables that is uh, referred to in the language is basically measurable or, or you can give it some value. So theoretically, you can actually uh, measure at every day, every given time where we are in that, pro in that process of inter a, 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 a equilibrium. And the point is, that all the issues that we are talking about today under the sustainability issues, and we give them all kinds of names like climate change or this or that or the other, are basically the system away from equilibrium. Okay. And being out of equilibrium produces stress. Now, when I say the system, I mean the whole biosphere, everything. The air, the trees, the humans, the animals, the birds, the waters, everything that is here, that is the system. That system is out of equilibrium. And being in equilibrium, like any other disease, shows signs of stress. And those signs of stress is what we usually and erroneously call environmental problems. They're not environmental problems, they're the system uh, uh, stressing and showing its stress in all kinds of symptoms that are very disturbing. And what is very interesting, if you think about it, you have the population and you have the carrying capacity as, as two elements. And the, the way population affect the carrying capacity through activity. So it depends a lot on the scope and rate of intensity of activity. These are the two important things there. How big is that population in numbers? And how intense is the rate of its activities? Is everybody flying every day somewhere? Are we all driving uh, SUVs everywhere? Uh, th th those kind of things. And there are myriad, hundreds of different ways in which human activity impacts the carrying capacity of the planet. But at the end of the day, all of those can be boiled to two essential channels, the demand on resources, or basically consuming the environment, if you will, 
and the generation of byproduct. Every, this is basic physics. Every activity generates some byproducts. Uh, we call those things pollution, although it's good chemistry. <laughs> Uh, so it, it can be heat, can be emissions, can be whatever. Uh, so what the, the system is out of equilibrium for a very simple reason. We are exceeding the capacity of the planet to regenerate in terms of consumption of resources. You see that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this is, uh, you can see it in, in the way that fisheries are collapsing and whatever. Let me just finish one thing. And we are exceeding the capacity of the sinks to absorb our byproducts. So those two key elements that are the essence of that equilibrium are, are just gone crazy. If you want a very simple way to uh, look at it. Sorry, you were going to ask something. Oh, well, so do when the ocean exceeds the carrying capacity as it seems to be now. I mean, that. We, we, not only we're exceeding, but we are actually reducing. Uh, look at fisheries, for example. By fishing the way we do with those huge factory boats that go out for nine months or a year with nets that are 30 miles <laughs> and, and, and carry everything that there is, we are basically emptying the oceans of life. So. The, 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 They're cutting all the aboriginal, forest. All Aboriginal communities always knew. I mean, they didn't have the science. They didn't know how to measure it. But intuit intuitively, their connection to the planet, their connection to Earth, their connection to what we call nature. I don't like to use that term because we are part of it. Uh, by saying we are nature, we make exactly the distinction that allows a lot of these atrocities. But those communities, people were for Ian so well connected that they could intuitively understand how not to exceed certain limit. You don't just go and shoot everything that walks. You don't just go and fish everything. You take what you need and you make sure that what is there can replenish itself. And your concern is also reflected in all kinds of uh, shamanic and other uh, uh, you can, I, I don't want to use religious kind of any ceremonies of thanking the, the very animal that you killed, you thank for giving you life and allowing you to continue. And therefore you're not going to uh, overstep your boundaries, so to speak. And with the industrial revolution, I think we began to behave like a kid in a, a toy shop <laughs> and all the toys are made of glass. So we're just breaking everything apart and thinking that we are having a great party and enjoying a greater and, and greater uh, 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 standard of living or whatever. But the damage that we're inflicting uh, on the world is immense. And as it turns out, the damage is also inflicted on ourselves uh, in many yes. psycho whatever ways. Yeah, so, so in, a, in a systems theory, systems approach, you see everything interconnected and so you brought up the industrial revolution. So it really is it's all, it, it, the economic system, the political system, the ecological system all feeds progress. And as you say, that keeps, that keeps leading to uh, imbalance and equilibrium and it leads to the symptoms we see like what we're seeing in the Northwest or Pacific Northwest, or you know, all the different things. So um, basically, we're, we need. I mean, your approach also, Michael, is systemic change. Change the structures. I mean, I mean, Buckminster Fuller. Just just to um, read a quote from Buckminster Fuller, a famous quote. I, I put it here. Um, he said, "You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete." So, so do you, do you feel like with, with the sustainability laboratory, Michael, is that what you're trying to do to, to build I, a new I, system? I, I would say, yes, but I want to take a step backward because you said a number of things that are very important and I, I'll have to try and, and deal with them uh, one by one. The first, you're talking about what's happening on the Pacific Northwest and related to climate change in terms of rising of temperatures. 
it's fascinating because most people look at climate change as an issue of temperature rise. So the image is of, uh, you know, summers becoming a little hotter or, uh, you know, we'll have to use more air conditioning or, or whatever. But there's much bigger things happening there. The change in temperatures is modifying some of the major cycles in the biosphere. The temperature, okay, you'll sweat a little more, but that's nothing in comparison to the damage that is going to be inflicted. And we can see it, like in the conversation theory, uh, series that we have at the lab, uh, we had the, uh, uh, Jennifer Francis, who is a climate scientist from the Woodswell uh, Climate Center uh, Research Center. And she, her research is focused on the impact of changes in temperatures in the Arctic on other parts of the world. And what you see there is that the melting of the, uh, the, melting of the ice in the Arctic and the changing dynamics there impacts tropical storms down south by changing the dynamics of atmospheric patterns, by changing the moisture contact of the air, by changing the ocean levels and all of those kind of things. So it's much more than temperature. There, there are, there, when you talk about things like climate change, there is a systemic uh, modification used, done, or, or, or being brought about by human activities, a systemic modification of some of the thing that makes life on the planet possible and bearable. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's much more serious, but then let me go to the issue of the structure. Uh, this is a concept that is so important and is somehow lost on pretty much everybody. Uh, it's a concept that goes back to Norbert Wiener, the father of, cy of cybernetics. Norbert Wiener and some of his colleagues, Norbert incidentally, to those who don't know, was a professor of mathematics at MIT. Uh, he was a child prodigy in mathematics. I think he, he had his doctorate in, in mathematics at 17, after which he worked in England. With, uh, anyway, he was a professor of mathematics at MIT, and during the war, he was uh, a kind of a, a, a called to put together a very interesting multidisciplinary group of physiologists and neurologists and people from the early computer science days to develop a new control mechanisms for anti-aircraft guns. What happens there was as jet aircraft were introduced, I'm sorry that I need to go to a war example here. Uh, as jet aircraft were introduced, human became too sluggish in following them and aiming and shooting and then correcting if they missed. So the idea was to develop an automatic control system that will replace human in controlling guns that we'll be able to follow. Radar was coming in at the time. So we'll be able to follow a target, shoot at it, uh, correct deviations if they, it missed and, and so forth. And that was the, the, the birth case of cybernetics, if you will, as a theory of control and communication of regulating mechanism. So in 43, Winner and some of his colleagues uh, wrote a very obscure paper that I'm sure very few people ever saw uh, that was called uh, Purpose, Behavior, and Teleology. And in that paper, they established a very important connection between the observable output of any system, any black box, you see something coming out, it's observable. The output is its behavior, right? And its internal structure saying that any observable output, regardless what the system is, is mediated, is produced by a particular kind of structure that may be visible or may not be visible to an observer. Now, think how important it is. It sounds simple and not a big deal, but think how so often when we want to change something, when we want to modify something, when we want to improve something, we are focusing on the behavior, not on the structures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, the structures are much more mm -hmm. difficult mm -hmm. to deal with. Now, and so the, 
any system state, any state of any system is produced by some structure. And if you happen, if you want mm -hmm. to get a different outcome, you need to change that structure. It's not enough to get a list of goals. I want those goals to happen and then go after those goals if the structure still stays the same. Because if as long as the structure is there, you'll keep getting the same result. And what is the structure we are talking about here when we talk about those issues of sustainability, the issues that get us out of equilibrium? It's the existing uh, economic framework. <laughs> it's the existing structure of the financial markets. It's the existing structure of governance, both national and international. It's all, it's an existing structure of education. And all of those, it's the, the existing value system. It's the existing institutional thing, the existing uh, uh, structure of business and what business pursues. And the fascinating thing, of course, and what makes the change so challenging is that all of those things are interacting, right? The, the, the demands of the economy edu uh, uh, tells you how to educate MBAs that then continue the same uh, uh, structure. And this is controlled. With, so all of the things not only are connected by the self, the self reinforce and amplify. So we have a very powerful, complex system here that is usually resistant to change. But if it will not be redesigned and reconfigured, we are not going to make it. I mean, there's no other way. You can announce 17 or 30 or a million sustainable development goals. But if you don't go after the big engines, you're not going to get it. So we are celebrating a lot of nice sustainability related thing, uh, including the lab, but these are pittance that, that they're drops in the bucket. You know, people do organic gardens and people do this or that. And we're saying, uh, we're celebrating those as big achievement, but at the same time, look at the scope of what is happening uh, in the Amazon basin. I mean, people don't understand the size of it. And again, it's not just the cutting of the trees like the temperatures, it's a complete modification of the whole hydrology cycle of the Amazon. Completely change of uh, the, the, the content of uh, moisture of the air because the moisture that comes out of the trees ends up being blocked by the, and, uh, the, the Andes and falls on rain that feeds the Amazon basin itself with all the rivers and so forth. And we are getting to a point now where the destruction is such of such proportion that that whole hydrological cycle is being modified. And if we don't stop, it will mean that the whole basin will turn into, uh, in, into savanna and then will end up like the dust bowl in the 20s and 30s in the United States. It's a very dangerous thing. Uh, now, people think about the Amazonas, the Amazonas basin, so you, you have in mind like a, a, a nice valley with a lot of trees, but the, the area is humongous. It's actually bigger than the you know, continu contiguous uh, United States. You don't see it on the Mercator map because of the distortion that you get. So the North United States looks smaller in most cases than Brazil, but it's a huge area. And the, the kind of destruction that is happening there, and it impacts everything. It impacts the, the, the biodiversity, the other lives, uh, the, the Aboriginal communities, the hydrological cycle, uh, and so on and so forth. So the, the impacts are cascading and amplifying. So what I'm trying to say by all this is that there is a huge discrepancy between our understanding of the problems and our efforts to address it and the magnitude of the engines that continue to push us on the destructive way. And I think that climate change and the climate change convention and the agreement in Paris is a very good example for that. Because what happens there after 50 years, even more actually, uh, the, the notion that something is happening to the climate has been around for a very long time. And 50 years worth of this discussion uh, with the, the international panel on climate change and all the other kind of things. 
it, it, it took almost 50 years for people to even begin to accept it. But then most of the time went on arguing what will be levels of emissions that we will thrive to, reduction of emission, whether it will be 2% or 5% or 3%. That's not where the problem is. The problem is not in reducing emission, but how to get out of fossil fuels. It's a completely different kind of thing. And, and you'll approach it differently. Now, mm -hmm. think about what we talked earlier about the design approach. If you say my task is to, uh, to reduce emission by 1%, first you start all the arguments. Uh, uh, you are emitting more than I, so why should I reduce emissions like you? And, and should it be 2% or should it be 1%? And you get into this uh, argument that everybody has been involved with in the international community for the last uh, uh, a few decades. If you say we have to get out of fossil fuels and we have to get out of fossil fuel in a hurry, you have to put a, 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 a major world kind of uh, world design <laughs> science project together about how within 10 years or something to get out of fossil fuels into other uh, re renewables. So you can specify what are the conditions that have to be there. And the conditions are not 2% less emissions than what was in 1995, a zero emission, full stop. Now, get me some good designers to produce a system that can feed the world with the energy that it needs with zero impact. That's the task. It's a completely different task. So again, what I'm trying to say there is that the, the systemic way, the, the system view lead you to look more carefully about the underlying structure. Remember we talked when you, in the context of system, you look at what are the key variables and how they interact. The key variables here, as we mentioned before, are the value system, the culture, the institutional arrangement, the governance, the financial market, the education system, all of those are the key variables. They interact in a particular way that not only produces the unsustainable state, but also uh, amplifies <laughs> that whole trajectory. Sorry for taking so long. <laughs> oh, no. No, these um, are. So to big disequilibrium, but in systems, disequilibrium is also that that stress is what produces a systemic change, does it not? I, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear you um, very well. That when a system goes into uh, systemic change, uh, when, when it goes into well disequilibrium, doesn't that the big change? Michael, can you help me with this? I think it's it's yeah, yeah, bunkered it for me. Dan, it's uh, freezing up a little bit. Sorry, Anadea. Uh, I think. Um, okay. Yeah, she was talking about when a system goes into disequilibrium, kind of complexity theory and the laws of emergence, when something goes into disequilibrium, the pressure then can force that systemic change. Is that correct, Dan? Day? Am I saying it right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's very important. That, that's a great. I, I'm really glad you brought this up. W what is... <laughs> So everything we said means one thing, that the underlying, that there is an issue of change here, right? We need to change something that is prevalent now into something else. And here, we need to understand change processes as well, if you we want to bring about change, especially in days like now where everybody's supposed to be a change agent. <laughs> so, there are two fundamentally different kinds of change. The, the concept is due to a group of psychologists on the West Coast, uh, Watslavik and his colleague. They made a differentiation between what they call first order and second order change, where first order change is change that occurs in a system while the system still stays the same. Mm -hmm. And second order change which is change that requires a switch in, in logic, if you like. The system itself is no longer what it was. There's a shift, a major shift. 
that's where the emergence notion that you are interested in comes about. Something else emerged. And what happens in evolution and evolutionary processes, any kind of system that is well adapted to its environment, that is in equilibrium, if you like, in a sense, suddenly there is a change in its context. And the equilibrium is no longer uh, working. It's out of equilibrium. And that forces the kind of change that has to occur in order to resolve that discontinuity, that, that, uh, that, that conflict right, between the system and what is required. Now, what happened here? You can look at everything that we talked about from that view that the system that we are part of is in a birth pang. <laughs> mm -hmm. It knows it needs to bring birth to something new yeah. and it struggles and it has discussions like we are having here and it has all these conferences and all these projects and humanity, everybody is restless and trying, let's do change and let's bring about something better and do this and do that and do this. So this is what needs to happen. But what is happening here now is that that urge, that uh, not urge, that not a good word, the instinct, the collective instinct of, of uh, that a, a change is required is blocked. And what is it blocked by? It blocked by all those structures that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and that's true for every second order change, because by, almost by definition, any given system, any given state, uh, somebody benefits for, from. And you can bet your whatever that they will resist the required change. So in, in our case, uh, we, are, we, we really need to bring about a, an enormous change. And that change is not looked well upon by a lot of very powerful agents in that system that we are talking about. So they are blocking that. And again, you can, you can interpret as this is something that I like to do, to interpret all those uh, problematic condition that I earlier talked about as symptoms of a disease, these are the, the, the symptoms of what happens when you block things from happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You get a headache. And the headache is manifest itself in all those kind of things in temperatures rise and this happening and everything goes in smoke and humans increasingly shooting each other and all kinds of other uh, things that are stressful events, if you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the, the conditions that we are at, at requires change. It requires a second order change. Unfortunately, from what I see, most of the attempts at change are first order change uh, uh, strategies. And you can never achieve a second order change with first order change strategy. So to go back to your question, Michael, uh, what we try to do with the lab is to try to develop, uh, how shall I say, it, at least uh, demonstrations of second order change in our little projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and in that regard, even a little project like uh, Project Quadiatir that you would want to discuss uh, down the road a little bit, uh, is it's a tiny project in a God for second part of the world with a small community, in this case of Bedouin. But to me, that project is like a microcosm of the planet as a whole. And yeah. in the sense that we approached it uh, from a strategy to say, we need to bring here a uh, second order change and bring that change through design innovations that are reflecting all the dimensions uh, that are part of the sustainability principles that we didn't have the time to talk about much. And I, I, I don't think we should go back there, but we need to simultaneously bring about change in a number of key dimensions. The material dimension that has to do with energy and matter that underlie existing, the social dimension, the community uh, level, the economic dimension uh, and, and all, the, all the others.
simultaneously. Yeah. Because when you look at, uh, th there are hundreds and hundreds of really very nice uh, uh, projects around the world today that come under the sustainability umbrella. But when you look at them closely, most are sector or issue specific. So there are problems about energy and problems about about water or yeah. projects about women or projects about this. And we are saying you need to integrate whatever you do on any issue. Everything has to be integrated. So you have to deal with the social aspect of it. You have to deal with the economic aspect of it. You have to deal with the physical aspect of it. You have to deal with how you impact other forms of life of it. You have to deal with the spiritual dimension of it. All of those have to come simultaneously if you want to produce a demonstration of second order change. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's great, Michael. It's brilliant. And um, so, so I guess we can talk about your the projects of the Sustainability Laboratory. Um, we have the video about Project Wadi Atir, and um, and and from your website, sustainabilitylab.org, um, that I put in the chat box for everybody. Uh, I wrote down the projects you have: Project Wadi Atir, the Global Sustainability Fellows Program. Sustainability Prize at Earth University in Costa Rica, Project Turquoise Mountain. And then you were talking about, um, you were telling us beforehand about the uh, Canary Islands and Bhutan, the projects there. But let's talk, would you like to talk about Project Wadi Atir? Should we show the video? Yeah, uh, why not? Uh, uh, yeah. You, you, you know your time zone, so. Yeah, we, we could talk forever. Oh, and, and you are you are yourself with the Sustainability Laboratory Tori are doing a speaker series also. So for anyone listening who would like to um, um, hear Michael interviewing a lot of leading lights in sustainability, you have one coming up July 6 with um, Tom Lovejoy of the of an expert in biodiversity. Is that correct? Yep. And and people could go onto the website to um, to to sign up to find out more. You know, I, I think so. I I'm uh, I think uh, a, a, list, uh, a little bit of, uh, maybe you 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 have that thing right. You I'll, have I'll get the information. I'll send it out. So you email. can send it out, right? But anyone interested, the sustainabilitylabs.org. I put the uh, link in the chat box. You can find it. So um, let's let's show the video about Project Wadi Atir, uh, and then we'll go from there. But here we go. Project Wadi Atir is the flagship development project of the Sustainability Laboratory. It is a groundbreaking initiative with a Bedouin community in the Negev Desert that demonstrates a model for sustainable dryland agriculture, showcasing Bedouin tradition and experience leveraged by advanced technologies. The project's radical innovations enabled it to overcome obstacles that were previously considered insurmountable. Project Wadi Atir encourages cooperation among diverse Bedouin tribes and provides an opportunity for Bedouin women to work alongside men, even holding key leadership positions. The project's herd of goats and sheep enables the production of high quality dairy products. A seed bank and training program returns indigenous vegetables to household use, improving nutrition and health. The cultivation of medicinal desert plants showcases Bedouin healing traditions and enables the creation of health-related products. Following a waste to resources approach, the site is supported by an integrated infrastructure of green technologies and its ecosystem restoration initiative has restored a barren site to productivity, combating desertification, enhancing biodiversity and mitigating the effects of climate change. The project educates thousands of students annually and has attracted visitors from around the world. Project Wadi Atir is a model of hope and transformation, contributing to the improved well being of the Bedouin community and demonstrating the sustainability laboratory's approach to development in a way that is replicable and scalable in arid zones throughout the world.
messed up this video. Okay, there we go. Yeah, um, yeah, we, we could talk about second order change and structural change because that's a that's a really important topic. Um, that we'll um, we'll talk about for, for hours. We'll uh, but we'll um, talk about what you been doing with the laboratory because I think it's really important also for people to understand that the work you're doing and so so with project Wadi Atir you took a barren desert I mean with with the support of the Bedouin community and got the universe Bengarian University and some others and and really as as the video shows showed the hope and transformation that can that can be created in in a way that goes outside the system in a way as an example of second order change. Um, well, the best, uh, you, you know, the best symbol to me of the second order change in Project Quadratir, and there are many, and I'll talk about in a minute, but the best to me, the symbol, uh, one of the things, when, when we got that site, uh, I, I wish I could show you some pictures now, but uh, we, we don't have, we didn't anticipate this. Uh, we have satellite images of the site. We have the site is about 100 acres that we managed to get from the government uh, against everybody's expectations. Uh, and that site was, if you look at it, it was basically moonscape. It's it, it really nothing was there. Uh, and it's an area where the soil itself has completely lost its fertility because of hundreds of years, thousands of years actually, of uh, monoculturing and overgrazing. So that part of the Israeli Negev desert, the Northern part is actually human made desert, if you like. Uh, in Byzantic time, 2000 years ago, this was a very fertile uh, area. In fact, it was uh, producing tremendous amount of wheat that was exported to Rome. But as I said, over the years, the, the soil has completely lost its fertility, got devoided of organic matter. And there, another issue there is that the soil that is called less is such as this property that when it rains, even the little rain that we have there, which is about 150 millimeters a year, uh, even that little rain doesn't, is not, the water is not absorbed into the ground. Uh, the, the soil hardens like concrete. So what you get is the patterns of erosion where tiny little uh, ravines feed into larger ravines that feed into ever larger ravines. So you get the phenomena that water never stayed in a place but produces huge floods, flash floods, sudden flash floods uh, 20 or so kilometers away in the different areas altogether. So part of that thing that we wanted to demonstrate there was an ecosystem restoration. Uh, and we've approached it by massive planting of a combination of trees and shrubs of different species, because we felt even without knowing that rather than doing a monoforest, like most forestation in Israel uh, has taken place, we wanted to create a real rich ecosystem. So massive planting and creating a series of flow impact lower earth mounds that would stop the runoff and keep the water in place. And this has been working very well, uh, as you could see from some of the picture that we, there are now beautiful green pastures there and really complex, uh, uh, complex small islands, if you like, of trees and shrubs, uh, a place that had no life, maybe a couple of scorpions and an occasional raven if there was a dead animal. Uh, now supports about 56 different species of birds. Uh, many of them are nesting there and, and so forth and so on. But what I was all this story is to say that in the winter, when we got those big uh, 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 pools of water that really keep the place going without irrigation for the rest of the year, uh, we get ducks who come there and swim in those ponds. And so, Duck is not a, a species of animal that you would expect to see in the place. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they are returning every year to me became the symbols of the change that we produce there. But we approached that, that project by defining the kinds of innovations, the kind of 
changes that we want to bring about in all those dimensions that I spoke about earlier. So for example, on the community level, uh, the idea was that the, the, the Bedouins were uh, tribal as you know, and the tribes are not always cooperating very well. We said, we don't want this project to be associated with one village or one town or one clan or one tribe, but we want it to reflect the cross sector of Bedouin society. And we were able to put the project team together uh, that really people come from different backgrounds and different places in the same. We said from the out, you, you cannot even imagine how radical that was. We want women not only to be part of the team and work together with men around the same table, which just simply doesn't happen, even in social cases, but we want women to have, uh, uh, to have positions of leadership and men working under them. This is as crazy as you can get. And I'm very happy to say that uh, three years ago, we appointed a young Bedouin woman that was hired for the project, joined the project two years earlier uh, as the CEO of this undertaking. And as you can see from even the picture, it's a major undertaking now. It's, uh, it's not a small thing. Uh, and it's like managing $15 million operation uh, uh, there. And she's been doing very well. And this was one, one of the most radical innovations to say we want her to be the CEO. And everyone who gave you advice tell you, don't ever do it. Nobody will ever listen to her, blah, 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 whatever. But what happened was very important. We had all these guys who were like heads of departments, if you like, of different, the, the project team had all these guys who were directors of different activities. And they were all butting horns all the time and all the ego was flaring up and you could never get anywhere. And suddenly this young woman takes over and brings in some, I don't know how to call it, female uh, energy of a blessed source, kind of creating a family sense. And suddenly everybody starts under her leadership, work together and behaving and so forth and so on. Uh, to me, this is an indication uh, that it's not, it's something that I felt beforehand that, that how much the planet is, is uh, how shall I say it, is hungry for more female energy in, in the leadership of the bigger things and say, get, get out of all these generals and all these guys who only know, is, as they say, to butt horns with each other and so forth. So that's another major innovation there. We also are, exper are experimenting with a cooperative structure, if you like. Uh, the people there own the project. They share it. There's no, they're not, they don't work for anyone else and so forth, which leads us to the innovation, the economic dimensions. Uh, usually, uh, marginal communities like this are approached in a, in a, in a very uh, kind of top-down view that they are lesser people, and therefore you have to give them some uh, little education so that they can get some simple job that you and I would not want to do. Uh, we said we're not interested in that. What we want to do, uh, first of all, there's a lot to learn from this community. If you want to narrow about the desert, go to the Bedouins. Uh, but beyond that, how can we develop capacity and develop a group of entrepreneurs who will launch and own and benefit from their own businesses? And that's what we have created there. We have a number of economic activities that are producing increasingly nice income now, the dairy products, the uh, medicinal plant, the health related and, and all of those kind of things. On the physical level, on the material level, the material domain, uh, we developed that um, uh, integrated infrastructure of green technologies, uh, taking the uh, converting waste into resources approach where the waste of one function becomes feeds into another. So we, we have, a, 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 to give you one example, and at the heart is a, a solar wind and storage system that is not operating yet. We hope it will come uh, into operation next year. But uh, all the, for example, all the waste, all the organic waste goes to digesters that produce methane that we can use as a demonstration to people that they can use their hairs and all the, the, the uh, 
the, the, the organic waste from the herds to produce energy for cooking and, and whatever. So the digester in turn uh, produce solid, very high quality uh, 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 thing for fertilizing. And, uh, and a gray water that go into a series of wetlands mm -hmm. and are purified to the level that they can use for irrigation. So this was the way to deal with all those uh, issues there in a comprehensive way and connect it all together. And it took a long time. We launched that project, that thing in 2008. And as I said, it's a tiny little something, but it's a very, I think, a, a very powerful demonstration of uh, how you could put things together in ways that are different to where, the, where they were before. That's so inspiring that you're actually doing a project that demonstrates it. I want to ask half of our to the listeners, they can type, uh, and if you are listening, type a question into the chat. But the question that I think is on everybody's mind as we look toward the future, given this sex change, this systemic change that needs to happen, is is there hope that we can make the changes in the way we need to in time? I, I think that time is a critical aspect. Uh, from all the evidence that we get from science, uh, the, 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 the window of opportunity, if you like to call it that way, is, is, is not a forever one. We don't have 100,000 years to adopt. Things yeah. happen to have any hurry. Uh, and uh, it's important to understand that because there are two elements there that have to come together. One is the fact that things have to happen in a relatively short window. And the other is that they have to come together with a completely fragmented humanity. Fragmented in any way you want to look at it. Politically, uh, religiously, ideologically, everyone is totally fragmented they don't speak the, it's a tower of bubble now nobody's speaking the, the same language and nobody uh, not, not nobody but um, I, even even the the better educated I mean the people who read the New York Times I don't think that they have a clear view of the crisis that the planet is yeah. in uh, so th th there there's no understanding of the big picture and there is that total fragmentation that doesn't allow things to come together, as evidenced by the pathology of the United Nations itself. Uh, and it just shows you how serious that condition is. Uh, now, this is the first step to, I think, uh, dealing with any issue is to understand it correctly. Uh, and if you do, then you have the hope to produce the kind of second or the change, but the challenge is a real major challenge. I think it's totally unprecedented, which is what I talked about in the beginning when I said that the, the, <laughs> the, that was the reason for the lab. So the, the world needs a sustainability laboratory, but bigger than me and bigger than the lab <laughs> that we started here. That's what it has to become. Humanity has to come together around a major project. And that is to get out of that trap that we are in now. And that trap is especially dangerous because it has all the characteristics of, of vicious cycles that amplify okay. one another. Uh, and, and this is the most dangerous thing that you can be in. And how to re-engineer, rewire, reorient all that structure is exactly the kind of challenge that Fuller was, was putting in front of us in asking how to make mm -hmm. the world work. Yeah, and I, and I would say second order so change. Are you hopeful? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I, uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I never hesitated for a moment until very recently. I, I think I'm, I'm uh, kind of, I, I like to look at things on the positive side rather than uh, thing and I, 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 my basic assumption is that with goodwill and and so forth, you can really achieve an imagination. You can achieve anything, uh, and and collaboration. 
uh, you can achieve anything. And I think that life itself, and we are one aspect of life, we humans, uh, life itself has all it needs in order to understand the need for change and addressing it. But at the same time, I see the enormity of what needs to be done here, and I don't lose sight of it. Although sometimes perhaps I lose a few hours of sleep. <laughs> yeah. So, so we have a question from Marie, an interesting question. Um, and she said, I noticed, um, I, I guess she's talking, she said the sustainability project, I think she's talking about the video, the project Wadi Atir includes dairy egg products. And she said, there are many like the founders of foodrevolution.org who say people don't need dairy or eggs to be healthy and that going completely vegan helps with sustainability. So she's wondering if you can comment on this along with saying many thanks. Yeah, uh, uh, remember that we're not dealing with cattle here. We are dealing with sheep and uh, goats that are traditional uh, traditional, uh, what shall I call it, uh, traditional to the Bedouin community. And what we've done with that project is, you see, in, in older days when the Bedouins uh, lived in their state uh, as nomadic people, the herd was the heart of their economy. You had the herd and the family, everybody worked with the herd. And the herd supplied everything that you needed. It supplied the wool for uh, the, the, the wool for producing the tents and clothes and so forth. Uh, the bones were used. The meat was, of course, uh, eaten. The milk was eaten, and so forth and so on. Uh, but that economy, under the pressure of modern life, has completely changed, collapsed basically. And at the moment, Bedouins raise animal in order to sell a live animal. So they, they, they start with the lambs, they feed them for a few months and then bring them to market. So the, uh, the economic margins are very, very small and they don't get the full benefit of the herd. We are trying to return to a fuller use to contribute to that community by having what they have, which is goats and sheep, uh, 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 just used uh, uh, more effectively. As it turns out, incidentally, uh, milk from goats and sheep is quite healthy, apparently, uh, especially goats. Uh, they, they, are, they, they, they come as close to camels as any with, with the wonderful health properties of the milk itself. And I think that the product that we are developing there are, are really uh, excellent. Uh, really excellent uh, uh, by any standard. The, the yogurt that you have there, it's a mixed, it's a yogurt made from a mixed uh, goats and sheep. It's the best yogurt you've ever tested. So I know I'm not answering your questions completely uh, and directly, but I'm trying to avoid it by, by not admitting to the fact that having milk products from goats and sheep is something that is bad for you. Yeah. Well, well also, Michael, you're talking about like a local economy, every uh, sustainable coming from the locality. I mean, one of the falls of um, our industrial civilization and, and took us down the wrong turn was when we went from an agrarian, we're talking about in Europe, where, where the peasants, the agrarians, the farmers farmed on the, the land of the nobility. But then when the, the country started trading in India, and saw what they could get from India and, and what they could export wool, they kicked off the farmers, the, the peasants, and replaced it with sheep to make the wool. And everybody, everybody moved to, the, people had to move to the cities to get jobs. So that was far from a local, I mean, that was the beginning of unfair trade. So- We, so, we are going the opposite way there. Yeah, yeah. So, so Lisa has a question, this is a really good question. Um, she said, what was created in Wadi Atir? Um, um, let's see, something anyone in the Bedouin communities could recall, remember from their elders or their history, or was this largely a new unfamiliar vision? How did the values of the people need to change and how difficult was that? 
Okay, that's that's a great question. Great question. And the answer is actually very interesting. Uh, when we started this project, most of the people that we were engaged with at the Bedouin community had no concept about all the stuff that we are talking about, about the sustainability and the this and the that and the population and all, all those kind of things. And slowly, as the project progressed, they not only took ownership of those concepts that were, if you like, imported by the lab, but began to discover that those concepts were completely consistent with the traditional Bedouin way of life. That they have lived a, a sustainable, if you like, way of life in the desert, if ever there was one. And that the whole tradition supported uh, a, a, a correct way of living. And that the that correct way of living was destroyed by the uh, by the impact of modernity, and it, it manifests itself in many ways. Not only in the urbanization of Bedouin tribes and the fact that there's no more uh, uh, nomading, but even in things like diet. Like many other Aboriginal communities around the world, it's a group of people that were introduced into Western ways of eating overnight and suddenly you find all those ills of bad nutrition, too much sugar, too much this, too much that, uh, you, you know, sodas uh, of all kinds, sweet sodas are very popular. In every wedding, in every occasion, there'll be a few big plastic bottles of, of sodas, uh, people, moved from the traditional pita breads that were made from whole wheat, done by hand, grounded by hand, into the kind of pitas you buy in supermarket, which are just white processed flour. So in that community, you have incidents of all the sudden, all the ills of Western diet, uh, diabetes, obesity, all kinds of cancers, things that that community in its previous way of life did not know. And interestingly enough, it impacts uh, women especially, because women, no matter how hard their life was, physically hard, uh, they 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 were outdoors, they were they were active, and they were not eating too much. And now, their traditional role has ended. They're not integrated yet into the Israeli society. So basically, people sit home and eat sweets and get fat and with everything else that comes with it. So the, 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 it, it's very interesting that this project, by not by intention, uh, it also finds itself dealing with the community that is in this really violent uh, uh, and very powerful transition from one way of life to another. And what we are trying to do and what the the people who are involved with this project are discovering through the project is their own traditional values. And we are trying to amplify and bring those back in all kinds of ways. For example, they just started uh, at the project, uh, Lina, the, the CEO, just started uh, a Bedouin market uh, every once a month that brings in uh, a, a traditional craftsmanship, and, and uh, all kinds of uh, foods and things like this. Nutrition has become a very important part of the educational component of the project. We didn't talk about this, but basically we are now operating there in agricultural school. And until COVID started, until uh, February of 2020, we saw 1,000 students every week, 1,000 students per week. And it's now returning to things. So the, the, those activities are, are allowing the traditional culture itself to blossom and the people will to rediscover what they have been forgetting about their own uh, background and tradition and so forth, which mm -hmm. I think is what, this is something I never thought about uh, before. Uh, but, but I see now is one of the really exciting parts of that project. They don't have to say anymore, 
according to the sustainability laboratory or something, they can say the Bedouins have always done this this way, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a change. Yeah. So we have another question, Michael, uh, really from Brandon, a really impor important question, a big question. And maybe um, this will be our last question, unless anyone else has something they really want to ask, since we're now an hour and a half into it. And, you know, we could we could keep going, Michael. This, this is great. This is so important. But Brandon asks, how do you deal with the strong powers you mentioned earlier who attempt to resist change when attempting to enact second order change? And then another question he asked, what are the steps to inspiring people to look beyond small wins like the UN sustainability goals and to dig deeper to breaking the current unsustainable structures? Well, I, I don't know that I have an answer to this, uh, uh, how to deal with the big engines. I, I, I think that one important way for me is literacy. Uh, there's so much misinformation everywhere the interesting thing is that we have the tools now to get everybody on board, if you like. Uh, but the wavelengths and the social networks and all those wonderful tools that we have uh, are, are still dominated by uh, nonsense. I, I, it still is correct that statistically the, the most time uh, spent on the internet is on pornography and things like this. And I'm not talking even, I'm not even getting into all the political misinformation that everybody is throwing out. Uh, I, literacy is very important. Humanity has to come together uh, both emotionally and conceptually, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, my own way to deal with things is uh, uh, rationalizing uh, and, and, and conceptualizing. Uh, but that's not good enough. You have to really uh, uh, amplified by the emotional uh, uh, connection to things. So I think that the, the most one very important part of the task of how to deal with the change is creating the effective ways to increase the literacy of having more and more people understand what is actually going on and what needs to happen in order to change it, and then have faith that uh, that you know uh, 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 that 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 have faith. What what I mean by have faith? Have faith that that there is enough goodness and capability in humanity to actually uh, make that transition. And you can see it. What one thing that I find is very inspiring, although I also realize uh, the question of scale there, is the, the, the kind of young people that we are coming in touch with in the last decade has changed dramatically. The, the, the youngsters that come to our Global Sustainability Fellows program that you talked about, which is basically a summer kind of session, trying to inspire uh, stronger leadership in those issues. These are kids from all over the world, incidentally. We typically have uh, 20, a group of 20, and they'll come from 18 different countries, including India and China and, and whatever. Uh, and these are kids, they are either during or after their master's level uh, education in any subject. And these are kids that are as good in any, as any. I mean, they can go to Goldman Sachs or, or, or anywhere. Uh, but they really want to do something for the planet. They really feel that they want to dedicate themselves to bring about that change. They don't know how, uh, but that that uh, in intuitive urge is there. And I think that this is the material that we have to work with and strengthen and encourage. And that's what will bring the change at the end, hopefully. Yeah. Well, more and more Don Quixote's out there. So that that's exactly what you need. Huh? Yeah. So, well, um, yeah, thank you, Michael. Again, your website is sustainabilitylabs.org. It's in the chat box. So hopefully everyone will go look at Michael's website. And um, we've recorded this. We'll send out the recording. And then I'll also have the link for people interested in your speaker series. You're doing it once a month. We have one next week, uh, Thursday, uh, July 6th, I think. 
Um, <clears throat> but we'll 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 uh, let people know. So I, I thank you so much and uh, tribute to our our conversation tonight. Everybody who came on, everybody stayed. We never have that. We never have uh, hundred percent participation from beginning to end. So um, thank you for for really uh, such a great conversation and election conversation and everything you've done, Michael. And um, we I hope to uh, talk more. Talk again. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you both. It's it's. Uh, I always enjoy this conversation with you. I think you are doing a great thing uh, with this series in order to increase awareness of many of those important things that need to happen. Yeah, for second order change. Yeah. So, thank you very much, and have a wonderful evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you much. very much. I could talk for hours with you. I love what you say, and I so appreciate it. I have many, many questions, but my audio wasn't doing well, so I just right. became quiet. But I would love to follow your work more. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Have a good Bye. night. Uh, have everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Peace out.